Hi, in this video I'll be interviewing Rosie Ingebrigtsen, a clinical oncology social worker. We'll be talking about depression. What is depression? How do you know if you have it? And what are your options for getting support for your mental health during your cancer journey? Hi, Rosie. Thanks for being with me today. So let's talk about depression. Depression is something we hear a lot about, but people might wonder how do they know if they have depression and how common is it during a cancer treatment, cancer journey? How do people figure out if they have it and what steps should they take to get help? So thanks for asking about depression. It's, it's such an important topic when we're talking about cancer. Um, and it's incredibly common to experience depression while you're experiencing cancer or while a loved one is. Um, so it's actually, you asked how common it is. Um, about, so about one in three people diagnosed with cancer will experience depression, anxiety, or both. Um, so it's a pretty staggering number. Um, and they do often present with mixed symptoms. And we're, we're going to be doing another video on anxiety and cancer as well. Um, so in terms of, um, in terms of depression, um, you asked sort of how to recognize, you know, that, that you might be experiencing it. Um, and it's really tricky when you're also dealing with cancer because um, a lot of the symptoms of depression are, are actually symptoms of cancer and its treatment as well. So things like sleeping too much or too little, um, feeling fatigued, um, feeling, uh, having appetite changes. So weight, uh, in addition to weight loss or weight gain. Um, so I'm, I'm mentioning some of the ones that actually really frequently overlap with cancer treatment that can be hard to parse out. Some of the other ones, though, would be things like um, feeling a, a flat affect, so kind of feeling like, um, you know, you're not having any highs or really any lows. Um, others with depression present more, um, a lot of lows, you know, feeling really, really sad, really down all the time. Um, some folks uh, might even experience suicidal thoughts. Um, and I, so I should say, anytime I'm talking about depression or mental health, I always want to put in right at the beginning, um, there is such a thing as a mental health emergency. Um, so if you are ever experiencing suicidal thoughts, um, thinking of harming yourself or someone else, call 911 or go straight to the emergency room or tell a loved one who is in the room with you who knows um, about you know a, a safety plan. Um, so that's a really important piece that I always think I just want to get right out there at the beginning. Um, but, you know, thinking, thinking about death is, is part of the cancer experience. It's also part of depression. Um, there's a ton of overlap. So I think some people, they picture depression just being sad all the time, right? Um, but it's a lot more than that. Um, it's feeling slowed down. It's feeling, um, like I said, can be feeling flat, um, like you, you know, like you don't have much emotion at all. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different criteria for depression um, and for major depressive disorder, which is the, the actual diagnosis that we're usually talking about when we talk about depression. Um, you would need to have a number of these symptoms over a prolonged period of time. Um, so if you are feeling some of these symptoms of depression, or you think you might be, the only way you can know for sure is to be evaluated by a medical or mental health professional. Um, so that's really, really important. But know that it is common. Um, and I think one of the most frequent ways that I hear from folks who, it turns out maybe they are experiencing some depression, anxiety, or other mental illness, is when they say, I just don't feel like myself. You know, I don't feel like me. Um, and, and that can be a real kind of red flag. Um, another thing is, you know, if you feel like you don't want to leave the house or even get out of bed, um, that's a pretty common early sign of depression. You know, if you just feel like you want to sleep all the time or can't really motivate yourself to do a whole lot. But again, it's so tricky because if you're feeling crummy and you're in chemo, you know, maybe you don't want to get out of bed and that's like really reasonable, right? So, um, so it's complicated and that's why it's so important to talk to your medical team about it. If you even have an inkling suspicion that, that you might be even experiencing a few of these symptoms. So what happens if somebody does say, I think I'm depressed, to the clinician they reach out to, their oncologist, their radiation oncologist, their surgeon, and the doctor or nurse PA says, oh, everybody feels this way during chemo, or of course you're sad. How, how do you then navigate that where you're actually reaching out for help and you kind of get, the, you kind of get squished down or invalidated even? That's a good question. Um, gosh, I hope that's not happening too often um, because that can be so hard if you reach out for help and someone 
says, I don't think you need help. Um, so, you know, there's a, a few different things you can do. Um, if you talk to your oncologist and for any reason they're dismissive about it, um, the first thing I would say is advocate for yourself, actually, and just say, you know, actually, I, I think this is really serious. Um, here are the ways that it's impacting my life. Um, it's, I don't think it's just the treatment and I really think I need help. Um, if for any reason, you know, I hope that you have a medical team that you trust. Um, if, if for any reason that you don't feel like they're listening or, you know, if you need to talk to somebody else about it, your primary care doctor is a good resource if you have one. Um, so, you know, you can call your primary care doctor's office. Um, they are equipped to help uh, manage mental illness. So, you know, that's certainly a resource. Um, I would also look for um, perhaps a different member of your oncology care team. So if you talk to one person and they're dismissive, that doesn't mean that everybody will be. Um, there may be an oncology social worker in your cancer center. I hope that there is. Um, so you can ask uh, anyone on your medical team and say, I'd like to speak to an oncology social worker. So that's someone like me. Um, they won't be able to prescribe medication, but they can definitely um, do an assessment, uh, make a diagnosis if there's one that's appropriate, and um, help get you the care that you need. Um, so the most most important thing is to continue to advocate for yourself, which when you're dealing with depression, it can be so hard um, because really, this is another symptom of depression, really small tasks can feel just monumental. Um, so if you don't know that you're going to be able to advocate for yourself, another thing you can do is bring in a trusted member of your family care team, you know, of a family member, a friend, um, someone who's close to you. Um, and say, hey, I'm really struggling with this and I'm, I'm not really getting anywhere, so can you help me navigate this? Um, and you may need to make sure that they're on your medical paperwork, you know, that they've, you've signed off that they can, you can share information with them. Um, but, uh, having a patient, having an advocate, um, in your team is a really wise decision as well to get the care that you need. It's such a good point that people who are depressed have a hard time sort of overcoming that resistance to doing anything. And I love your point about, bringing in your family and a friend and other people who love you. And they may actually be the ones to notice that you're not yourself. Definitely. Yeah. The next thing I wanted to ask you about is this idea of mental illness and how depression is sometimes stigmatized or even, unfortunately, something that people think you're just not trying hard enough. All of us know people who've been depressed who struggled with that. Like, just get up and make your bed and all those tips and tricks about improving your energy level. And it can be hard to ask for help because of the way our society views depression and other mental health problems. And I think it would be really helpful to hear you talk, how do you talk with your clients and patients who want to be strong, you know, they're, they're running the house, they're the strong woman or the strong person in the family and asking for help for something that a lot of people think is just, I hate to say this, but a weakness of character or lack of will. How, have you seen that happen? And how, how do you hold space for people going through that? How do you counsel them? Yeah, that's such a good point. And it is something that people really struggle with um, really frequently. You know, I'm happy to say that I think some of the stigmas around mental illness are that, that have been such a part of our society for generations are just starting now to sort of dissipate. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of on all of us to destigmatize mental illness. Um, and one of the most helpful things to others is to express, to share, you know, what you've been through. So if you're a patient who's dealing with mental illness, if you can, if you can find it in you to be open with that, with the people around you, you're actually going to help make such a difference for people in the future. So that's one thing to say. Um, but if it really does feel uncomfortable to you, you're not alone in that. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that some of these mental illness effects of cancer and its treatment, um, you know, they're not just in your head. They're biological experiences that are happening inside your body and inside of your brain. And so um, to, to get a really good understanding of what's actually happening in the body and in the brain when depression is, is a part of life might help um, to, to really understand sort of the medical side of it. And that's something that hopefully your social worker, your doctor, your NP or PA or anyone on your medical team can help educate you on, you know, to, to really understand those biological processes of depression depression or anxiety or whatever it is that you're dealing with, um, and, and so that you can it, you can help kind of conceptualize it for yourself as part of the physical experience, the physiological experience of having cancer. Um, 
And, you know, when you talk to your loved ones, it, it's probably going to be uncomfortable at the beginning. You know, it, it probably is. And if you're somebody who has, um, who feels a lot of expectations and pressure in the family to be strong and to be, you know, maybe you're, uh, I think you said like the, you know, the matriarch or the, you know, a, a leader in your family, um, it can be really hard to admit that you're struggling. Um, and that goes for the whole cancer experience, right? All of a sudden you need help. Roles are changing. Your adult children might be taking care of you or, you know, it, it's, um, it's an uncomfortable experience, but the more open and honest you can be about what you're feeling and what you're experiencing and what your medical team is telling you about those feelings and experiences, um, the better off everyone will be in, in helping to manage this. And then just knowing that it's normal to be uncomfortable about this stuff. It's not an easy thing to talk about. It's not an easy thing to live with. Um, and so just giving yourself a lot of grace about, you know, yeah, of course this is uncomfortable. Like, depression is uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's a physically uncomfortable process to feel depressed. And so, um, you know, it's normal to not want to talk about it all the time. It's, it's normal to struggle, to be honest with your family. Um, but just the more that you can push yourself to go there and get the help that you need, the better your experience will be and the quicker you'll start to feel like yourself again. So you've mentioned a few times getting treatment for depression, and obviously I always tell my patients, I can't take good care of you, which is my job, if you don't give me information. So that importance of the connection and conversation and being open and actually asking for help is part of what your medical team wants to do, right? So... Uh, but when we talk about treatment, are we talking about medications? You know, you're already getting all this stuff in your body. You're getting radiation and surgery. And there are a lot of people who don't want to add more things into their body in terms of pills. And I, I know as a social worker that there are other things people can do instead of or in addition to medical treatment, meaning medication. Can you go through some of those that you found helpful in the years that you've been taking care of people with cancer? So when I say treatment for mental illness um, and for depression, I'm not I'm not actually just talking about medication. A lot of people hear treatment and you maybe think like, okay, my treatment for my cancer, it's chemo, it's radiation, it's medical treatment, right? But treatment for depression is a much broader uh, topic than that, you know. So medication is often a piece of it. Um, I've worked with countless folks over the years who have been started on like a low dose antidepressant, something like that, um, when they're when they're going through treatment and um, you know, they've been nervous about it because there is sort of this stigma around medications that's similar to the stigma around mental health um, that we talked about previously. Um, and, you know, the truth is that for a lot of those folks, they start taking this medication, they expect this, you know, to feel really different, to maybe feel off. And the truth is they, they find a few weeks later, maybe six or eight weeks later, they say, oh, you know, I actually, I feel like me. I just kind of feel like I can tolerate this a little bit better. And it's like, wow, that's wonderful, right? That's what we want to see. And that's usually the response that people get. Um, in, in addition to medication, though, which, it, which isn't necessarily right for everyone, um, we would always want to see someone getting additional support as well. So, um, you know, if you are prescribed, say, an antidepressant, it's likely that your provider is also going to recommend some individual counseling if that's available to you. Um, that's sometimes available through the oncology social worker in your cancer center. Um, that, that can be a really good resource. Um, or you may look for someone locally. Um, there's uh, good ways to find a therapist would be to, um, to ask someone on your medical team um, to call if you have a local community organization that focuses on cancer or mental illness. That's a good way to find um, a provider. Um, but so yeah, talk therapy can be a huge asset to treating depression. Um, there are also other things that you can do that can improve, that can help improve symptoms of depression. So it's, it's really hard when you're, when you're depressed, but gentle exercise is huge um, in helping to uh, regulate some of those um, chemicals that are creating depressive symptoms. Um, so if you're able to get up and go for a walk, I know it's even harder when you're in treatment, um, but if you are are able to get yourself moving, um, get some sunlight, some fresh air. Those things can be really helpful. Um, joining a support group, which we have another video about if you want to check that out. Um, joining a support group can be a huge help, um, especially one facilitated by a licensed mental health professional, particularly if you if you do know that you're dealing with a depression, a, a diagnosis of depression. Um, it, you know, it's good to, to talk to a professional and figure out whether that group is going to be a healthy fit for you. 
Um, and then things like uh, journaling, gratitude practice, yoga and meditation. I'm naming these things and they sound sort of like fluff or extra, but the truth is that there's everything I've named so far, there's really good research, scientific evidence that shows that these things work um, in helping reduce symptoms of uh, depression and other mental illness in people with cancer. Um, so, you know, doing things to take care of yourself and remembering to to do things that make you feel like you. So things that you enjoyed before that you're still able to tolerate even when you're dealing with symptoms of depression and with cancer treatment, which can be really hard. Trying to find time and ways to, to connect with those parts of yourself that you used to enjoy um, will help bring you back to feeling like yourself. Um, but I also think it's really important to say there's there's no sort of like magic bullet in dealing with depression. Um, so, you know, if, if you're depressed and someone says, oh, go outside for a walk, right? That might feel like, yeah, okay, this is bigger than that, right? So when I'm talking about these things that can help, it's really important to find the combination that works for you. No one yoga class or one therapy session is going to be the solution to this problem. Um, but a combination of things that can help, uh, help get you back regulated um, can really make a huge difference. Um, but the most important thing you can do is ask for help when you need it. This is so helpful to think about body, soul, mind, the social aspects of depression and how important it is to be kind to oneself and to continue to think of yourself as a whole person. So I really appreciate the recommendations you've given. One of the things that our people watching this video may wonder about is having access to mental health clinicians, people who are, you know, like you, people who are so kind and encourage self-compassion and knowledgeable like you are. What if you live in a rural area? What if you, you know, are paid so poorly uh, that you can't afford to have somebody highly skilled and there isn't a volunteer organization? You know, these are pain points for people, especially with, you know, the world is as it is. We're all hurting. And, and what is it like? How would you advise somebody who's on a wait list, let's say, for mental health counseling treatment? How do, how do we respond to those incredible needs for help now? Yeah, it's, it's so tricky. And, you know, it's such a shame that these services that are just essential, in my opinion, can be so costly for folks. Um, and insurance, it doesn't always cover it. Um, so one thing to do is to, to find out, you know, if you do have insurance, to find out what's covered before you go in for any kind of therapy, because it can, it's very expensive out of pocket, or it can be. Um, and so to find out, you know, to make sure you're in network and make sure that what you're, um, the person you're seeing is going to be covered is essential. If you don't have access in your area, um, you know, if they're if you live far away from um, from any prof mental health professionals, or if for any other reason you have kind of you know barriers to access, um, there's a few different things that you can do. One would be to uh, I, I keep saying talk to your oncology social worker. Obviously, I'm biased because I'm an oncology social worker, but if you do have one in your cancer center, they often do actually provide short-term adjustment to illness counseling, and that can be a huge resource. Um, sometimes, you know, if you get into therapy you don't always need to be there for a year every week, right? Some people can get a whole lot out of four, six, maybe eight sessions. Um, so, you know, trying to find some short-term counseling is definitely better than nothing. And a lot of times it's it's all you need. So, so asking your oncology team, is there someone in the cancer center who provides these services is huge. Um, there are some online and phone-based resources as well. So two that come to mind would be um, the Cancer Support Community nationally um, provides, has a helpline that's staffed by licensed uh, counselors. Um, so it, that if you go to cancersupportcommunity.org, the, the number for the helpline is there. Um, I believe they also have a live chat. Um, and there is, there's also an organization called Cancer Care that I believe has a hotline that's staffed by oncology or by uh, professional counselors. Um, so calling somewhere like that. Um, the American Cancer Society is sort of a, they have a, um, like a resource kind of clearinghouse type system in place. So if you call them, um, you'll talk to a trained uh, resource navigator, a cancer resource specialist, I think they call them, who can help uh, point you in the right direction and find out what's local to your community. So um, it's a lot, it can be a lot of legwork. This is another reason to, uh, to bring in someone in your family or a, you know, a friend or chosen family member to help you with this um, because it, it can be a lot of phone calls to make. Um, but chances are there'll be something that you can find either on the phone, online, 
online, or you might be surprised to find something in your local community that's available. Um, one other thing I would mention is, you know, a, a counselor for depression does not have to be specialized in cancer. So if you don't have, say, like a cancer support community or a Gilda's Club or, um, or even an oncology social worker, you might have something like um, Catholic Social Services or Jewish Family Services or another community-based organization that provides things like free counseling. Um, so a lot of times folks just aren't aware that those things are there because you probably never thought, you know, you'd find yourself needing them. Um, so doing some, some outreach in your own community and finding, um, you know, finding those resources can just be a matter of connecting with the right person. So it can take a little doing, but there's a lot more out there than you might realize. It's so important when people are depressed, to, you can feel so hopeless. And what you just provided was a lot of hope, a hope, hope that not only is this treatable, but that there really shouldn't be barriers to accessing help for something that's so important during such an important and challenging for many people time of their lives. So thank you so much for that. Thanks for all the great information and, and really useful tips and tricks and resources. If this video has been helpful for you, if you click like and subscribe, that helps other people just like you find this video. And don't forget, if you go to yerba.com, you can get your personalized report and learn more about your treatment options and what to expect as you go through treatment.